Welcome to Oregon Camp Meeting. This year is different. The closest person to me is about 30 feet. Uh, camp meeting is usually where thousands crumple against each other and fight for the veggie meat sales. And it's amazing that we face what amounts to a biblical event. This is like any of the other plagues we've read about in Scripture. It's worldwide. But we've been admonished, don't be afraid. Even though there's suffering around us, God is near. He has not forsaken his own. We're here at camp meeting because there's a vision here by the leadership, which I congratulate that you've been praying together. And many, many other fields, other conferences are joining these meetings as your own. Welcome. There are individual churches and people and groups and homes who are tuning in. Welcome. Oregon Conference's vision is simple. I remember in 1983, uh, I received a, an underground cassette, it was called back then, and this cassette was uh, of a presentation that a young man named Steve Jobs had made uh, to uh, a group of uh, uh, computer programmers and futurists in what is now called the Silicon Valley in Mountain View, California. He, he talked about that in the future, we would have computers available to everybody. In fact, he said, one day we will hold our computers in the palm of our hands. This was shocking for me to hear because I was a computer programmer uh, programming on basic back then on an Apple IIe and this was the CEO of Apple with their little machines which I thought were already the best that's ever been. He said one day we'll hold it in the palm of our hands and one day we will be able to listen to our music on the palm of our hands and I didn't know how a turntable with my favorite album and a needle was going to fit in the palm of our hands. You see, when you look at the future, you can see things that the average person's never dreamed of. And, and Steve didn't stop there. He says, we'll be able to, to bring down what we call download our favorite movies. And of course, back then they were VHS video cassettes. And if you had a, a, a what do you call it, membership to Blockbuster movie, and, and they made all their, their money on late fees because you never returned them on time. The idea of a VHS cassette being reduced to something in the palm of my hand was beyond what I even knew how to imagine. Well, this guy, only a few years later, like uh, 10 years later, moved in because the next year he, he announced what was called the Macintosh. I was in shock. It took me till 1986 to get my first one. And I couldn't believe how simple the concept of a mouse with a long tail connected to the computer and typing and fonts and graphics. And I made my own uh, 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 what was called desktop publishing. New terms were being invented. I'll never forget it because as the Macintosh grew and grew, one day he said, you must be the computer. The vision is that the computer becomes an extension of yourself. And the next release of the Mac was called an iMac. I'm the Mac. That, that, that's a powerful concept that the computer is the extension of me. If you bought any other computer, the manual was this thick and you'd be leafing through pages to try to figure out how to run your computer constantly. But the Macintosh was made so that even a child could sit down and immediately discover and create. And as you used it, the Mac truly became an iMac. Windows uh, did its best to duplicate the process in other machines. Uh, suddenly, international business machines, the IBM that had run the world to that time, including the Pentagon, I'll never forget this because it was not, uh, Popular Mechanics 1959 and, and they had an IBM in the Pentagon and, and they interviewed some people there and Popular Mechanics uh, said in the future, this is in 1959, the computer of the future will weigh less than one ton and it will fit in one room. Steve Jobs made it an iMac. 
And then the day came where I began to see what he was talking about in 1983 with the iPhone. Suddenly, my computer is in the palm of my hands. I can download my favorite songs, which drove Hollywood and Nashville and Motown crazy because no longer can they monopolize music. Now you could, you didn't have to go to Tower Records anymore. You can download your favorite song without having to buy the entire album. Then without the permission of Hollywood and the other centers, you can download your favorite movie, iPhone i mac so it's not just a phone it really is an extension of who we are try to live three days without your phone i bet you won't make it to three hours the idea of this being an extension has come to pass it is who we are and and uh, to tell a congregation to turn off their phones doesn't work they're quietly putting it on silent and texting while you're speaking, as you are doing right now. This guy's weird. He should shave. Amen. I know what you're texting. You see, the power of this, it, it has redefined. It's not just a phone. It's an iPhone. And Jesus made it clear. It's not just believe. It's about I believe. To, it led one person to finally exclaim, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. I believe too. You see, the power of I, when it's not selfish, is when you apply it to yourself. And that's why Florida Conference, it's not just serve. It's not just the value and the biblical power of service. It's I serve. It's an extension of who we are. Check it out. I'm going to do this, but let's pray first. The power is that I alone can do certain things. I have a unique collection of gifts. You have a unique collection of gifts. We each are so different. It's, and if each of us decides, I serve, I serve, I serve, then we are serving. Congratulations, Oregon. This is great vision. The power of making it personal. It's time, brothers and sisters. Our nation's in trouble. The world is in trouble. We have a pandemic that is still in the throes of its first iteration. There's still another one coming. It's not a, <clears throat> it's not a time to be afraid. It's time to ask ourselves, what can I do? Not just what can my money do, and we're grateful for sacrificial giving because we're needing it more than ever before. But it's not just what can my money do, what can my hands do to relieve the suffering of someone else. Just tonight before I came up on stage, I received word that another dear friend of mine has been hospitalized with COVID in South Texas. Now in the East Coast, in Washington DC, all the way to New York, just in Maryland alone, we've seen 46,000 cases and lots and lots of our, our neighbors, the sick, many neighbors, friends, colleagues. Some of you have been spared the brunt of this. Don't debate it. Ask, what can I do? Like those two men told this paralytic at the gate, beautiful in scripture, silver and gold have I none. But what I do have, I give to you. Get up. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. God wants to do miracles again. And he chooses to do them through his people. Here am I, O Lord. Send me. So let's bow our heads and pray about this. Join me. Father in heaven, come down. Bless us. We are in severe danger on this planet. The economy is melting down. Lord, we are fighting amongst ourselves. Everything needs to be addressed. It's time. Invade us with the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. Awaken us. Call us for such a time as this. So now, Lord, 
I empty myself before you. Save me that I can speak of salvation with another. Speak, Lord, for we are listening. In the name of Jesus, amen. I'd like to read to you from the book of Mark. The book of Mark, chapter 10. Beginning with verse 35. Another one of the scenes of the disciples fighting over who's going to be first in the kingdom. I know that's never happened at your church. Who's going to make first elder this year? Who's going to be head deaconess? I know that's never happened. I know you all get along really well in the congregation and never had any issues. I'm, I'm stalling to give you time to find it. Those of you who are looking it up. Mark chapter 10, beginning with verse 35. And I'll just read the narrative and then comment. And James and John, the sons of De Zebedee, came unto Jesus, saying, Master, we would that you should do for us whatever we desire. So far, the prayer looks good. And Jesus said to them, What is it that I should do for you? And they said unto him very humbly, Grant unto us that we may sit one on your right hand and one on your left hand when you get to your glory. But Jesus said unto them, you don't know what you're asking for. Can you drink of the cup that I'm going to drink of? Or can you be baptized with the baptism I'm going to be baptized with? You see, drinking his cup means you're going to be beaten within an inch of your life. And baptism is you're going to die on a cross. And uh, then uh, uh, verse 39, and they said unto him, yes, we can. And Jesus said unto them, you will indeed drink of the cup that I drink. And with the baptism that I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand or on my left hand, it's not mine to give. But it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when the other ten disciples heard this, they began to be very displeased with James and John. And Jesus called them to himself and said unto them, You know that... That which those are which, that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles, you know, government leaders, they exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise power upon them. But verse 43 changed my life. But it will not be so among you. You will not be lording power over each other the way governments do. It will not be so among you. And Jesus said, But whoso will be great among you will be your servant. And whoever will be the chief, the greatest, shall be the servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. The power of the ministry of Jesus is that he didn't come for us to serve him. He came to serve us. When he washed his disciples' feet, these were simple, consistent examples. I didn't come to do what you guys are used to doing. The human nature of this is to always be fighting over who's going to be number one. And whenever you've heard this story over the years, you, you, you've no doubt been like me. Look at these selfish guys, you know, taking care of business. Well, he'll be prime minister and I'll be the assistant to the prime minister. That's, the kingdom of God is not who's in charge. But we keep thinking that's the case. You know, if they would just make me an elder, we would solve this on the board. No, you wouldn't. Whether you're the elder or somebody else is the elder, the board, just they just like fighting. It's human nature. I don't know why. But put two humans in one room. There are two things they can't argue about. Religion or politics. It's true. Don't try this at home. But that's how folks do it. They, 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 if it's about the political world, it's the liberals and the conservatives, and each is convinced that the death is impending by the hand of the other. 
And if it's about religion, well, we're not supposed to do this, and we're some, well, this music, this, this mustaches that are appropriate, and those which are not. You see, the human nature is to be number one. And the powerful part of this story is that Jesus did nothing to correct the number one need that these guys had, that the need to be number one was not in his answer. I liked what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. did in his analysis of this passage. In his exegesis, he performed an assessment of, of, of Sigmund Freud and, and Joseph Adler, two leading psychologists whose research continues to impact among the many other psychologists of today. And uh, Freud said that the primal need of humans, the, 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 the essential or the essence of humanity is sexual. That was, that's why you have these Freudian things that people talk about. And um, some people give an idea that that might be true, but that's not the case. While God gave us that gift, that's not the essence of who we are. Joseph Adler came up with another suggestion in his research that I found most helpful in my journey. He said that the greatest need of humanity is to be distinguished, to, to, to be special, to be noticed. Have you ever watched children playing? There's always the loud one. There's always the bully. There's the popular one. There's the one sitting out there on the edge watching. That was always me with the notoriously low self-esteem that never seems to go away. And you watch from a distance because you're afraid of being hurt, either physically or emotionally or otherwise. But the kids want to be distinguished. The best soccer player, the best basketball player, the best whatever. Have you ever served a table surrounded by kids? And uh, their pieces of pie, which one will everybody go for? The one they consider the best piece, which is the largest piece. Yeah. Uh, notice how it doesn't matter how old the child is. I've seen 65-year-old children fighting over the size of piece that they got. How come I got this little one? The power of wanting to be distinguished, to get the best, to be the best, to be recognized as the best. That is, I think, pretty accurate. And the disciples knew that Jesus was Mashiach, that he was the Messiah, the anointed one. And, but they, they had come to expect a, a military general instead of the savior of the world. They just thought it would be the savior of a nation. And they thought that he would be a general who would drive out the Romans militarily and set up the crown in Jerusalem again, like King David come back. But Jesus had a bigger vision than that. It was universal. It was the salvation of the entire planet. And these guys are fighting over when you set up your throne in Jerusalem, who's going to be prime minister? I'm qualified. I've been fishing for 30 years. I know how to catch fish, and I'll do that politically. It's interesting how people want positions. I remember one guy said, I've been passed over for elder for three years now. And I said, well, you just messed it up. You're going to be passed over on your fourth year. You don't talk to me like that. You can't demand a position. Those things are led by God. You want to hear some trivia? I never was elected an elder in one of my churches where I was a member. Not once. And I was never elected a youth director in any of the churches where I served uh, as, a, as a, a, a person growing up after my baptism in 1970. I, ne I never got elected a youth leader, and I ended up being the leader of the youth of this denomination. It's impressive how God has his own plan that's bigger than us. You can't ask for a position. The humility is servanthood. And, but Jesus didn't say, shame on you guys for wanting to be number one. He says, I know what you guys are talking about. But government leaders, they lord over people and, and exert power over them. It will not be that way with you. Whoever wants to be great, but right, check this out. Be a servant. That was very humbling. We want people to serve us, but 
when we have to serve. <sighs> and if you want to be the greatest of all, be the servant of all. I'll never forget it. I, I was at the White House. Uh, we were eating breakfast in the state dining room. Great food. I highly recommend it. Whenever you're in Washington, drop into the White House. It's good food. Anyway, I, I was sitting over with Office of Management and Budget, and we were discussing issues, and we had an agenda that day for the meal. And, and um, nature calls. So remember when you go to those events, go to the restroom first because your body has a way of just everything becomes quite functional at the right moments. And so I, I, I approach the doors and a soldier clicks his heel, a Marine, and opens the door like a robot. It's amazing. You get chills down your spine. I'm still inspired by the uniform of our great nation. Those guys still give me chills down my spine. I come from an army family and we have served for generations, honorably and proudly. And to have this young man click his heels and, and then there's an Air Force uh, a person who's in charge of anything you need. I said, restroom, oh, downstairs, go down the east uh, wing and the, the president's library, that's where the men's restroom is. Oh, thank you, well, very good news. And so I went down to the east wing, made my way and I saw the library. And there was the fireplace with the rocking chair where Franklin Delano Roosevelt used to sit and talk to the American people in his fireside chats. And I went to the, perform a brief inspection of the plumbing facilities. I'm happy to report everything was in functional order. There's a reason for this detail because I went to wash my hands and the towels are paper. And they open up about this large, and they have a gold seal of the president on them. You think I'm going to waste that towel drying these hands? No, I dried my hands inside my suit jacket and put my towel in my pocket. I have a whole collection back at the house. <laughs> I can pay rent with those. I've seen them on eBay. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget, uh, you know, we, the poor, we think different, don't we? <laughs> it's mine. Anyway, I, uh, I, I get back to the state dining room, and this is the reason I'm telling you the story. A man in a navy blue suit over here looks at me, and he says, come here. I like the turkey. Can you get me more, please? Sure. And I took his plate. <laughs> I went to the butler's. Oh, no, no we'll handle it. Oh, sure. The, the guy in the blue suit, table seven, they, he liked the turkey. We'll take care of it. Thank you, sir. And then I went and resumed my seat in a special location. The guy was really embarrassed. And afterwards, they, I was told by the one other Latino in the room, don't you hate it? They see us and right away, they think we're the hired hands. And I'll never, it just came, I praise God. It came natural, I said, what an honor that even in this place, I'm perceived as a servant. The power of servanthood is not what position you have or what role in society you're performing. Are you serving? Yes or no. It's not about service. It's about I serve. Adler was right. We do want to be recognized. And Jesus says, if you want to be great, be a servant. If you want to be the greatest of all, be the servant of all. You see, be number one. Be number one in compassion. Be number one in loving others as you love yourself. Be number one in sacrificing your time to relieve human suffering. Be number one. Be distinguished as the person who gives of themselves like nobody's ever seen before. So be distinguished. Take that human need to be number one and serve people. It was later that Jesus, just before he ascended to heaven, he says, I was naked. You, you clothed me. I was hungry. You fed me. I was sick. You came to see me. I, I, I was a stranger. You took me in. I was, I, I, I was in, in prison and you came to see me. Well, when did all that happen? When you served them. That's what serving me looks like. It's not a social gospel. 
helping a family that's suffering through COVID, their loved ones in the hospital. They can't touch them, see them talking. They need food. Take them a box of food. So you social distance, you wear your mask, you on the porch, here it is, and then it will let us know if you need more. You see, the power is when you serve. I serve. As I serve God, you understand it best in how I serve others. You see, it's not just about God saving us. It's about God using us to save others. This is a time our nation's going to need this. We're divided politically. We're divided religiously. We're divided. We don't even know how to take the pandemic, whether to wear a mask or not. While I have friends dying, as we speak, someone's telling me, why am I wearing a mask? You see, as long as we look horizontally, we'll never get it because the need to be number one will be the, I need to win this argument. And notice that you'll never win the arguments. It just gets worse. God needs a latter day movement driven by a latter reign of the Holy Spirit. A latter day movement of people who don't just look at the horizon and say it's a mess. Now let me join the fight and see if I can win the argument. See if I can find the magic Bible verse or the magic quote from inspired writings and I can shut them all down. That doesn't work. A kid, a 17-year-old girl named Ellen Gould Harmon in Portland, Maine, had a dream. In this dream, she, she heard a voice saying, look up. Uh-huh. No, 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 no. Look a little higher. I am. No, 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 mija. You know I had, there had to be some Spanish there. <laughs> no, mija, look. Look a little higher. I am. You're starting to sound like my mom. No, she didn't say that, but if I was there, I would have said that. 17. Hello. Look a little higher. But it just... Oh. She saw a path. Narrow and dangerous. And people were walking upward. And there was a bright light at the end of that path. And she noticed that one or two on occasion would fall off. A narrow and dangerous path. She learned to look a little higher. And so she took the path. And it was narrow. And there were moments of danger. But she stayed on it. And she got to see a place that eye has not seen, nor has ear heard, neither had has entered into the imagination of a people what God has prepared. I mean, she saw a table miles in length, but you could easily see to the other end, and it had the most delicious foods to me. That means enchiladas, tacos, we're talking about tamales, serious food forever and ever. Amen. You could tell I miss supper, huh? (laughs) We'll get even after the program. You see, the power of this vision that she had is that she learned something that stayed with her for the rest of her life. Look a little higher. My brothers and sisters, please look at me. The time has come. We're divided among ourselves. Jesus said, a house divided against itself will not stand. He didn't say it cannot stand. He said it will not stand. We're divided politically. The sanctuary is liberal, conservative politically. We're divided over masks. We're divided over, we're divided, the economy, we're divided. As it was, we were already divided. Now it's times 100. Look at me, please. It's time to look a little higher. We must look above this fray for the power of the Holy Spirit to call us to something we have never done before. It is time. Enough talk. Quit showing me your Bible verses and Ellen White statements without the context of I serve. 
We began as a movement. Somewhere along the line, we became an institution. But I only read everywhere that it's going to end as a final movement. Because we learn to look a little higher. We need each other. People are sick that we love. Neighbors, friends, and if your area has been spared, praise the Lord. Some of us are still in the middle of this suffering. I don't know what to do. I've been I visited with this, a lady who had had COVID for the second time. And, and, and I, I was prepared for surgery when I went into her house. She had them fumigate and, every, and anything I touched, she quickly sprayed it and wiped it. And she gave me an orange and I peeled it. And then she scooped the, 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 the peel of the, uh, the orange and tossed the plastic bag outside and came and sprayed it. And I said, let me your hands. Lysol doesn't work on hands in terms of comfort, but it killed everything that was there, including some of my skin cells. Her husband was in a coma for his second month, and the next day he died. We've been suffering out east. Quit debating this stuff. People are dying. We need to look a little higher. We really need to. And don't be fighting over who's the deacon or the elder or whether the, you like the pasture or not. I mean, this is silly. We need to look a little higher. We need each other. Not just I serve, but if everyone's thinking I serve, then we can serve for such a time as this. And as the economy sinks in and a potential economic depression comes and we have people hungry as never before beyond the parameters of 1929, there's no room for debate. There's only room for food. We need to look a little higher. It's time. We have reached that moment. Who's going to be first and second in the kingdom? I don't know. But Jesus said, they will not be so among you. If you want to be great, be a servant. If you want to be the greatest of all, be distinguished as the servant of all. That's powerful stuff. You have to admit it. Don't just say Amen. Look right now into the heavens and say, Lord, teach me. I don't even know where to begin. Teach me to look a little higher because I've been looking horizontally. I don't, there are people who haven't listened to a sermon in years. All they do is listen to make sure that it's proper in its use of Scripture and the inspired writings and if this pastor is converted or not or whether he talked about meat eating or not. Quit listening to a sermon that way. Look a little higher. Teach me something, O oh Lord. You may know 28 fundamental beliefs, but let's get to know Jesus in 28 fundamental ways by looking a little higher. Camp meeting is different. The Lord didn't call me to soothe you tonight. He called me to shove you around. I'm from the neighborhood, not the residential district. I always fit the profile. I'm what the bad guy looks like. Don't say anything. But you know what? I love Jesus. And this broken man only asked God for one thing tonight. Teach me, O oh Lord, to look a little higher. Want to be great? Be a servant. Want to be the greatest of all? Be the servant of all. Now, that's not Rojasian theological construct. That's the mouth of Jesus himself. We were told, and I conclude with this, that in the end, and I suggest that uh, this is looking pretty good as a, a, a shot at the end here, that we would return to a primitive godliness. You see, we become so sophisticated when we talk about the soteriological implications of justification and sanctification by faith. That's pretty sophisticated stuff. You want to hear it in primitive godliness? If you ask him to forgive you, not only will he forgive you, he'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. John 1, 9. 1 John 1, 9. Any questions? I like the simplicity. And Jesus said, unless you become like a child, you're not going home. To be like a child, childlike is very different than childish. I'll say that one more time. 
for the two or three left on this planet who take notes. Childlike is very different than childish. I think enough childishness has occurred. It's time we become like a child. My mommy, my mommy, my, my mommy, she protect me, huh, mommy? You take care of me. Yeah, mijito, I got you. I told you. My mommy would take care of me. See, that's childlike. The tantrum, that's childish. You have to wait till you get to Walmart for that to happen. You see, the power of, it's not just to believe, it's I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Make it personal. And I know some of you are thinking, oh, I hope she's listening. She needs to hear this. Make sure that so-and-so listens tomorrow. He need Forget about them. This is for you. Hey, it's for you. God wants to speak to you tonight. Each one of us now, let's look a little higher. You see, that's how heaven comes down and fills our soul. The Lord wants to live in us. Not just be a belief system in our brain. Christ in me is the hope of glory. When our first child and our second child and our third child and our fourth child were born, we went crazy. I went and told total strangers that our baby was born. I, I, I went to Walmart. It's a girl. <laughs> That's nice. Um, why is he telling me? Because she was born. When it's good news and you're experiencing it, you want everybody to know. So do you believe? If you can say, I believe, Lord, help thou my unbelief, then you're ready to share what you have seen with someone else. It is Jesus who finds us. Then we respond. This pandemic has changed every rule of public presentation. I've been preaching for 46 years. And I never learned the proper way to preach. I am a narrative inductive speaker. Which means we break every rule that exists. I'm an example. That God could use anybody. He could use broken people from the hood. Just like he can use sophisticated people that have wonderful sheltered lives. We're in it together. If I serve and you serve and you serve and you serve, then we're all serving. I'm a broken man, but I cling to him who makes us whole. What about you? This is one of my mother's favorite songs, and she's in her last stages of of Alzheimer's and I, I was thinking of her tonight and I, I want you to hear her heart as she sang this song in my youth. <clears throat> oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. How in the world in darkness I walked Jesus the Savior I met Oh what compassion and love he did show He met the needs of my heart Shadows dispelling with joy I am telling He made all the darkness depart
sins are washed away And my night is turned to day darkness I walked, and Jesus the Savior I met. Oh, what compassion and love He did show. He met the needs of my heart. Shadows dispelling, with joy I am telling, He made all the darkness depart. like me for since 1970 this is my 50th year walking in this message of truth that gives me no advantage over the person who's hearing the gospel for the first time it still comes down to I believe and when you come to experience the salvation of Jesus in your own life now you're ready to talk to another about salvation. That's what it means to serve. You want to be the greatest? Be a servant. You want to be the greatest of all in your community, in your church? Then be the servant of all. Let us pray together. Pour out upon us, O Lord, the power of the Holy Spirit. Go beyond our opinions. Go beyond our presuppositions. Everything is changing around us, and everything we thought we can do, we're suddenly realizing only you can do. Save us, O oh Lord. Save us from ourselves. Come into our heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay. Then shine out, teach me to serve. If each one of us is saying, I serve, then this is a, a true movement. Finish your work. Here we are. Send us. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. Go. Tell someone what you have seen. Go in peace.